Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Luke Wake, Senior Staff Attorney at the National uh, NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business. And we have uh, Stephen Blakeman of the, uh, from Yolo County Libertarian Party. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We're going to do a, something a little bit different on the show this evening. We're going to kind of talk about, we, usually we talk about issues, and we may get into issues a little bit. But what we're really going to do here is talk about how libertarians come up with positions on issues, mm -hmm. you know the basic underlying uh, philosophy uh, stated in a nutshell. Somebody, I, somebody wrote a book called, uh, you know, don't hit me, and, uh, don't hit people, and don't break, the, don't, don't hit people, and don't steal their stuff, and that kind of says it in a nutshell. I'd add huh. one more thing to that, uh, which is keep your word. Yeah. So you've got three three elements: no force, you know, no aggression, no fraud, mm -hmm. you know, no uh, uh, misrepresentation, and contract law. If you make a contract. You, you know, hold your you know, hold up your end of the contract. Mm -hmm. No force, no fraud. Keep your word. Those are the un, that's a really very very simply the underlying, uh, as I see it, the underlying philosophy of why or of how libertarians approach issues is obviously very different than the way Democrats approach issues and the way Republicans approach issues. Right. How is it different, Steve? Let's take welfare, personal welfare, and corporate welfare. How mm -hmm. uh, how would a libertarian approach the whole? A conundrum of uh, helping out the unfortunate and, in some cases, the not so unfortunate. Well, I think libertarians are, are you know, another way of looking at libertarianism is personal responsibility, personal freedom. And so libertarians are looking at the welfare state and saying we should just end the whole welfare state. Now, as a practical matter, we understand that that's not going to happen overnight, but it, but it has to be incremental. We have to do that for the good, not only the people that are receiving welfare, to end their dependency upon the state but also in a way so that people who are <coughs> on welfare know that they can also count on their fellow citizens to jump in and help them out. We do need welfare, but not as it's you know, offered by the state. Otherwise, we end up oppressing them more than we do helping them. And individuals, and especially in the United States, we are such a generous people and, and really have a libertarian spirit that we, we expect people uh, to jump in and help their fellow man wherever they can and however they possibly can do so. Uh, and a lot of times they'll look at it and say, you know, it's good for you to know that you have ownership in this and so you come in and you need to uh, earn what you, earn what you uh, get. So, you know, some of the labor laws we have need to be changed. Uh, minimum wage laws work against people helping people the the fund i mean an historical perspective i think comes in handy uh before the 1930s there essentially was no welfare right no state w welfare but there was a lot of welfare it was all it, private welfare. there was a lot of welfare you had you, you had, had uh, private charities uh putting together mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of uh, uh programs to help orphans to help uh uh, widows to help uh, people who were handicapped, etc. Mm -hmm. I'd like to welcome Philip Larea to the show. He's uh, <laughs> stepping in as well. Philip Larea from Minute.com. Uh, uh, welcome to the show. Thank we're talking you. about welfare and, uh, uh, and other issues from a libertarian mm -hmm. uh, perspective. So if you take a look at the whole welfare uh, conundrum that we have now, which really started with the Great Depression in the 1930s, mm -hmm. the whole idea is that People need to be helped. Well, we agree. People need to be helped. Right. And it was that that happened before the 1930s. That the problem was, is that was the American way. And, yeah. The and problem people is, did that through their churches. Yeah. Through their fraternal organizations. Uh, I mean, you look at the Shriners Club. The government didn't the Shriners Club, but the Shriners. Yeah. The 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 government didn't make the Shriners. The Shriners made the Shriners. Yeah. And the people of the United States gave to them out of the generosity that's sure. in our hearts as Americans. Yeah. To help other Americans. Yeah. Americans don't believe in leaving people in the lurch. Right. But they believe, they believe that people need the dignity, uh, they need to retain their dignity in, in earning what they get. But when you, can't, when you, when you have to pay someone an, an amount that you can't even survive as a business to do so, and I'm talking about minimum wage, used to be, hey, you know what, I'll, I'll give you two bucks an hour and you know, for this so much work, you didn't have someone regulating how much you had to pay someone if they were going to work for you. And even now, uh, in, for full disclosure, I'm, I'm part of the welfare system. I work as a welfare worker. 
And even now we have people that will work under the table. Well, I, and I think that, and, that, gets, and, that gets to the point because the, 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 the underlying thing is no force and no fraud. So you've got both. They with make the, the agreement. System. You've yeah. got both with the welfare system. You've got fraud on the people who work the system getting welfare when they're perfectly able of working. Uh, but it didn't, don't, used don't to be, to, it didn't used to didn't be It didn't used to be that way, right. And you also have force because the money that mm -hmm. is being given to uh, welfare recipients is being taken from somebody else right. by force. Yeah. If you don't pay your taxes, somebody, men with guns are going to come and uh, take it away from you. Yep. So well, the, you have the issue of, uh, in the United States, we're the most generous people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, Americans are expected to donate 2% of GDP, $360 billion individually, and that applies to 95% of the population. So it's not simply a matter of Bill Gates, you know, Warren Buffett doing their thing. Uh, and what it really comes down to is I think the frustration with charity is we all approve of charity. We also like to give where we see the need. Yeah. So that when we have people being arrested, as the pastor in Florida was for donating bagels to the hungry, mm -hmm. and he gets put in jail, you know, it's clear that this is not an issue of charity. It's clear that this is an issue of uh, a really important government business. Government raises a lot of money for the sake of turning it out again, and government does not want people interfering with that privilege. Would this be a regulatory issue, Luke? Uh, you know, just on that point, I would say, you know, it's really unfortunate on a philosophical level um, one of the problems with the, the welfare state as it is, is that if you are so inclined to, to be a charitable person, that inclination is, is um, to some extent diminished if um, you're because being Because you gave us the office. Yeah, I mean, if someone comes to you and, and asks for, for help, I mean, it, you know, I, I don't have as much aid to give as I would if the government didn't take a third of my paycheck. Yeah, but, exactly. You're not just giving it to the office. You're giving every time you get your paycheck. That's what I mean. Like, I'm, I'm using that as a... Oh, it's a euphemism. Euphemism. And, yeah, and your options are limited to where mm -hmm. you cannot give where you see the need. So yeah. you can mm -hmm. only give to who has been approved as the 5013C vendor, whatever the case may be, so that you're actually prohibited from, for instance, um, um, providing shelter for the homeless. That has to go through an approved government agency. Mm -hmm. and uh, government So to a certain extent, government has uh, enacted a monopoly on charity. That's charitable exactly functions. right, and it's a profitable And profitable the thing business. I think that we also need to keep in mind is that the amount of money gross dollars that are spent on welfare for uh, the down and out pales in comparison to the amount of money that's spent for welfare for various large corporations in mm -hmm. the form of import right. subsidies, uh, export subsidies, uh, uh, and, and, and all of the Crop various insurance. all of the various uh, corporate welfare programs. Right. And the irony of it all actually <coughs> is that it import, is the poor bank. who pay mm -hmm. for welfare. So when we think about federal, state, county, and city, various kinds of taxes, fees, and regulations, it ends mm -hmm. up that the poorest person, uh, maybe in a food stamps program or some other form of welfare, maybe gets 60 cents back on the dollar that they paid in. So mm -hmm. that the irony is that it's not a question of the middle paying for the poor, it is the poor paying for the poor. You know, the, the real unfortunate thing when, when you talk about corporate welfare is um, it doesn't usually go to you know, your mom and pop businesses. I mean, they're, they're apparently small enough to fail. But, but, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, it's, go, it's going to the big banks. It's going to Boeing right. the, for, with and, the uh, Import-Export Bank. It's going mm -hmm. to and, uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, well, the corporate farmers have also become dependent. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and, and I am one. And, I, uh, you and, know, so, I, you know, I plead guilty. And, and you know, living in Woodland, we, 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 it's, a, it's a huge concern. Farmers don't want to be dependent, but if they if they don't receive what they have already, then they can't meet their bottom line. Now some will some will profit from it, I'm sure. Okay, I mean it's not it's not full ourselves, but the whole idea of, of this dependency upon the government, it's just got to be people have got to start changing their their mindset mm -hmm. about what they're really doing and understand that, that our, our government is hurting our people more than it's helping our people and maybe it's maybe it's more of a psychological game but I think economically also they you know not in corporate subsidies and the welfare that goes out in in various payments 
are just taking out of the economy. They're not putting anything into the economy. And in the old way of doing things prior to the 30s, when all these ABC regulatory agencies started coming into, into being formed, people were putting money into the economy to put people to work. They didn't have to worry about minimum wages. They didn't have to worry about regulations. It was common sense on people to, hey, you know, it should be safe. If I want people to work here, it should be safe. So we've established that, that welfare, both corporate and, and uh, personal, mm -hmm. uh, violates the two principles of for no force, no, no fraud. No force, no fraud. What about business regulation? We have a whole <laughs> lot of, uh, you know, when, when the country was formed, Back in the sure. uh, you know 19, 18, 17, 1776, mm -hmm. there was no business regulation to speak of that I'm aware of. I mean, there may have been a whiskey tax, but that's about <laughs> it. Uh, and uh, of course, that's changed dramatically over the years. We, we mm -hmm. write hundreds of thousands of pages of uh, regulatory uh, rules and regulations on a almost seems like a daily basis. Uh, we're adding to the Federal Register, and the business regulation ostensibly. Is, for, is all to do good things, like keep the air clean, keep the water clean, mm -hmm. keep the workplace safe, uh, and you know, reduce uh, the dangers of uh, uh, tainted food or uh, drugs that don't work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. Are we better off with the government doing the regulation as opposed to markets doing the regulation? Well, just, you know, back, back when, and under the common law, there, there was a principle uh, the, the underpinning the common law. This is the law that we inherited from England before, uh, and it was, it's, it's the default. Uh, and to, unless, your legis unless the California legislature or Congress has enacted you know, positive law to, to sort of supplement that. And, 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 the, and the default sort of common law standard with all things was essentially this notion that um, you should conduct your business in a manner that um, does not you know, impose um, harm upon anyone else. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's, that's essentially a, a very libertarian ethos. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, would, I would call it a principle of natural law, the idea that just uh, I, I cannot, I have, I have no prerogative to you know, inter interfere or cause harm to someone else in the course of my own conduct. I, I have to be reasonably prudent with what I do. Um, so in other words, you, you would uh, enforce all of the dangers that uh, modern regulatory law tries to uh, prevent with uh, with nuisance law, you would say if uh, if a if a corporation does something that is fraudulent or is uh, involves uh, coercion in any way, you would say okay, sue them for you know for fraud, sue them for aggression, whatever it is. Well, you certainly could. Although I'll tell you, the reality is that, um, and I talk to small business owners talking about this regulatory state that is out of control. There really is no aspect of you know the modern business that is not regulated and heavily, especially here in California. And in fact, when I talk to small business owners here, as opposed to other parts of the country, everyone else is worried about Washington D.C. Hmm. Here, they're worried about Sacramento. I mean, so yeah. it, it it really is out of control. But there are some. I mean, unfortunately. Legal, you know, pursuing the legal system is is often uh, a very expensive remedy as well, and there are some situations where, um, I, I mean, I, I think in, in some situations uh, maybe there's some justification. And um, I'll give you an example of where of where a law to prevent bad things from happening mm -hmm. actually prevents bad things from happening sure. without protecting an entrenched uh, business interest. Sure. Well, I, I, I mean, here's a good example. If you if you had um, you know, we're talking about you know um, one of the uh, no force, no fraud, keep your word, right? Mm -hmm. So the no force um, government. How do they enforce business regulation? Well, they threaten you with terrible penalties, and if you don't pay those, then someone shows up and brings you to jail. So that's force, um, but no fraud. Um, I think the, the no fraud is, is is also a backbone principle. So if you've got an actor out there who is engaged in fraud and is duping folks, then there, there may be some legitimate um, some legitimate um, purpose in uh, a state oh, actor. Would, but wouldn't tort law to take care of that? It could. It could. Um, and and wouldn't the, does, wouldn't does the competitive all market all take care of this, that? To this wouldn't the competitive market put put somebody like that out of business anyway? Exactly. Well, see, so, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, there were three big events. We mm -hmm. had Sarbanes-Oxley mm -hmm. as a result of Enron and, Ex uh, 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 Enron mm -hmm. and WorldCom. Uh, we had the Dodd-Frank and Too Big to Fail. And what, we're, what we found with both of those is that it all fell on the small businesses that in fact entrenched 
the too big to fail, who are now mm -hmm. three times as large. Mm -hmm. So one could make the argument that the whole intent of regulation on government's part is to get a few players in the room. Today, as I came over here, I see that Allergan and Pfizer are thinking about merging. Why are they thinking about merging? Because they can't, um, they can't pursue their own businesses anymore. So, you know, is it a bad thing for government when it can say, geez, I want to talk to media, let me put six CEOs in the room. Hmm. And so uh, it's not merely an unintended consequence. One might argue that it is, in fact, an intended consequence. Well, you're talking about, I mean, th that also brings up the whole idea of regulatory capture. If you put mm -hmm. together a, a regulatory agency within a very, very short period of time, the people who uh, gravitate to working in that regulatory agency or being the head of that regulatory agency are going to come from the industry that is being regulated because, well, obviously, you have to get somebody from the industry because they know about they know about it. Uh, Once that happens, a revolving door uh, takes you know goes in goes See, in no, goes installed, I, I, I and, so. and people who are in the agency uh, know that mm -hmm. if they rule nicely for uh, the people that uh, are giving the you know the politicians the biggest uh, campaign contributions, they will get they will be rewarded by uh, with with a plum. Uh, easy to uh, do a job once they decide to leave the regulatory agency, working mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. Pfizer or whoever. Right. But see, I don't think business, I don't think small businesses have a problem with, with regulations or, or laws. I think what businesses have a problem with is that they that our government, our, our courts, our legislatures, and, and even the executive branch, in as much as are losing control. So some bureaucrat someplace is deciding what to do. So I'm going to make the rule because Congress didn't tell me so. And then and then the courts are going to step back and they say, well, you know, go ahead. And they're not taking they're not taking responsibility for actually mm -hmm. deciding what the law excuse me what the law, the law says. <laughs> so I I completely agree with that. I mean I, the, the problem from the I think the small business perspective is the fact that we have so much regulation that they're they're drowning in it. I mean I don't think most small business owners I talk to are you know are upset with the idea of sensible regulation. It's, mm -hmm. it's just the fact that they're just drowning in regulation and that it's constantly changing. These Caesar. Um, never ending, and you know I think part of the problem for that is that we, we've we've throw, you know as I talked about this common law principle that you you should be able to conduct your business in a manner that doesn't cause any affirmative harm to anyone else. But you know so long as you aren't, then you should be free to do you live your you live your life however you like. Um, and the problem is under under you know the, the modern um, constitutional system that we've had since the New Deal. Uh, there's no need when the government passes some sort of economic regulation on mm -hmm. business. They, they don't even. I mean, the, the standard under constitutional review is rational basis. They can think of anything that you know even conceivably supports it, and so they 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 eliminate the need to show that there's actually some some compelling need of any sort to to impose the regulation. And as a result, we were governed by the democratic process, and that's your check, and that's a scary thing. So well, you know, there's a real. Um a uh, cost to it. Uh, right, right in my neighborhood, a couple of uh, sisters opened an ice cream shop, had about six employees, and uh, about a year later they closed. Uh, why did they close? Uh, they were just interested in making ice cream. Uh, but they couldn't deal with either hiring a white collar person to interface with government for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they did, what is the cost of the ice cream? You know, what are they going to pay the employees? And now new regulations, you know, uh, planned parental leave and all sorts of things that the owner said, geez, you know, I'm taking on a criminal, criminal risk here by opening this business. Do I need that in my life? And so that people make choices that we don't even see in mm -hmm. the marketplace and say, you know what, I might have opened a business in some other environment, but today... Why should I risk being a criminal? All I want to do is make ice cream. You know, I'll do something where I'm yeah. a solopreneur and I'm the only person that I'm responsible for. Paint numbers on sidewalk curbs. And, we're, and that is exactly <laughs> what we're seeing, a country that is going to be bifurcated between the mega corporation and the solopreneur because everything else is just too complicated. Well, it really is true that um, our, you know, we have a, a research foundation in Washington D.C. for the NFIB Research Foundation, and and, and they do surveys of small business owners. Uh, very top of those, their their list every time they do the survey, the small business concerns are one, 
um, the just ridiculous regulations that they feel are just never ending, uh, B, uncertainty about what the government is going to do next. I mean, the, and, and, and they, they don't have, our surveys show they don't have in-house counsel usually. The most, I mean, we're talking about mom and pop businesses here. Well, you're talking and, about a very expensive proposition. If you're going to do it right, you've got to get a compliance officer. You have to have a, an in-house, uh, uh, you know, house attorney. You have, have, you have to have, yeah. uh, you know, personnel manager. Third-party administrator. And so they have all, all kinds of Thing. All kinds of, uh, of uh, bureaucratic personnel mm -hmm. who provide absolutely nothing in the way of goods or services but are a drain on the profits of the company. And a small company can't, simply can't afford to do that. Well, I think so that the other bright side of getting rid of most regulation is you'd have a hell of a lot more profit in the, in the small business sector. You'd have a heck of a mm -hmm. lot more efficient economy. And you'd have a whole lot fewer people doing totally unneeded things like being lawyers, and, sorry about that, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and personnel managers and compliance officers and uh, basically paper pushers. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Ilya Soman uh, from George Mason Law School, uh, he, he has a book out called um, uh, Democracy and Political Ignorance, I believe is the name of the title. Uh, make, makes a good point. Uh, in, in this day and age, the, the regulatory state is just so out of control that, I mean, it's really almost impossible for your everyday citizen to, to become you know, very well educated on, on all of the many uh, regulatory issues that are facing this country. Um, it, it, and when and, and the fact that it's so impossible to become an educated, I mean, I, I'm an attorney. And hmm. um, and I can only, you know, develop expertise on so many uh, niche issues. Uh, this, this in itself, I mean, sort of counsels for uh, smaller government, uh, the, the idea that people should be able to, with some sort of you know basic uh, common sense, uh, be, be able to figure out how to live their lives without inadvertently committing a crime. I mean, that's the fact not, that not being guilty of the, of, the, of the three felonies a day that we're all on average. Exactly. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. there, there was a fellow that we, we ended up, uh, NFIB's legal center filed an, an amicus brief in support of this, um, this fisherman uh, off the coast of Florida because he, he was prosecuted under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act for obstruction of justice for destroying evidence because he uh, threw overboard a fish uh, allegedly that um, that the, was supposedly under undersized, and I mean the Sarbanes Oxley Act was was enacted to you know prevent companies from shredding financial you know documents and things like that. I, I, it, it seemed uh, you know ludicrous that they were going to apply this to a fish, but that uh, the 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 prosecutor in this case took the most aggressive uh, interpretation possible, and I guess that's one of the problems here is that. Um, I mean, well, actually, in this case, the, the Supreme Court held that they, they, they had taken an unreasonable interpretation of this statute. But in, in, in the vast majority of cases where someone's challenging business regulation, the courts almost bend over backwards to uphold the regulation. And, and, and that gets back to a basic separation of powers issue that the courts are refusing, uh, abdicating their role to, to. Yeah. One of the other issues that you might have some expertise on, Luke, is uh, the whole idea of property rights. No force, no fraud, keep your word. If you uh, go into a contract to buy a piece of uh, property, you should be able to buy it without being, without that uh, uh, purchase and sale being uh, interfered with by the government. And we see uh, simple land transactions being stymied by, by the democratic state all the time. When you uh, uh, own property, you should not have to worry about the EPA or the Endangered Species Act or you know <coughs> various state uh, agencies coming along and essentially passing regulations or laws that make your land or your property worthless and, and in effect taking it away from you. And uh, you shouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, fraud when it comes to property rights. People you know selling you a bill of goods. Mm -hmm. How does property rights play into the uh, whole uh, libertarian, uh, what's the libertarian approach to property rights? I mean, I think the, 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 the same basic approach as, as we would apply with regard to economic liberties, right? I mean, I, I go back again to this, this, uh, this common law principle that uh, I, I spoke of, that um, individuals should be free to live their life however they like. If you own a piece of land, you should be free to use your property for any reasonable purpose, any, any anything that whatever floats your boat, anything legal. As but legal is a, a, a tricky word here, right? Because um, I mean, it, it has long been. I mean, since since medieval times, the, the since medieval times, the 
we, the state has, uh, in England, had the, the, po the power to enact positive law to prevent you from causing harm to your neighbors. And I think that's, that's, that well, is, that's, yeah. yeah, that's the legitimate use of exactly. the state. Well, and when we talk about the philosophy of something, it sounds as <laughs> if, you know, it's a matter of opinion. But in my world, uh, everything has a consequence. <laughs> So, for instance, today we don't respect property rights. Uh, you, you cannot own your home. You must pay, at the very least, annual rent, at the very least. In the your, form of property tax. In the form of property, property tax. tax. Yeah. So what's happened with this generation, when they saw the crash and they saw their parents' homes taken away, uh, for reasons like property tax or, you know, back do this or back do that, they said, you know what, I'm realizing that my parents got very little in exchange for what they gave. So, you know, I choose not to own a home. So the economic consequence of that in our economy where uh, trading property, building property, construction, everything associated with, with building property uh, goes by the wayside. And then, the, you know, the general government looks at the macro data and says, what went wrong? Why are people not buying homes? And we're going to see the same effect in education. So that it's not just merely a matter of, uh, you know, uh, there is cause and effect and there is enlightened self-interest and we can depend on it every time. So when we discourage something to such a degree, then we'll get the desired result. That is, we won't get that behavior. Well, there are real world impacts here. I mean, I mean, we can talk about it on the philosophical level, but you're right. If, if you know, one of the reasons that uh, the, the cost of buying a house is so outrageous for you know a young person like like myself is that California has passed so many laws that that I mean, the sequel review process. Goodness knows that adds uh, here in California. If you want to build something, you've got to go through all these environmental hoops, and hoops and hoops, and it just keeps going, and and all of that red tape. Ultimately, someone's got to pay for it, right? What, what percentage of the price of, a, of a, say, a three hundred thousand dollar home is, is red is red tape? Is government regulation these days? <laughs> I would argue, I'm, I'm you know, well, not just you, not you just use a baseline. 40, you can actually use a baseline coming out of the two thousand nine, coming into two thousand nine after the financial collapse, where you know it had to be real money. Values of homes dropped two thirds. <laughs> They have only increased because the Fed bought the mortgages. So if you wanted to say, what is a house worth, and what did that mean to my son who was in his early 20s, who might have been able to build that stepping stone to a lifetime of a valuable asset, perhaps buying a home for 50 or 60,000, uh, that was denied him. Yeah, but then you've got, the you get things like school boards raising fees on new, new, new homes so there's there's more than just red tape. You know, legislature is authorizing these local agencies to raise fees without anyone voting on it. So it's not and just it goes on and it goes on, on, on and on. And we're out of time. So we'll see you again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the show. We're on the web at www.accesssacramento.org.